Namaha Sambuddhasa. Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, fully awakened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Welcome, everybody. I hope you had a good week. So we're going to get right into this so I can get through this because it's pretty detailed. And what you're going to hear about is um, in the first part of the sutta. The sutta is the greater discourse to Sachika. And if you have the Majjhima Nikaya, it's on 332, page 332. And it's number 36 in the Majjhima Nikaya. Okay. Um, you've got this for recording, right? May, you're going to record it, right? Okay, fine. Okay. So uh, what's exciting here is that we get a glimpse of a couple of things. We find out that the Buddha, when he was giving lessons and giving suttas, he didn't always tell you exactly everything, but he left things for you to figure out. A um, good example of this is, for instance, studying uh, anatta. And when we teach you about that, you find out, well, he didn't exactly say it out loud, but it comes out very clearly when you figure out what the teaching about anatta was. And then all of a sudden, you can see everything very clearly and you can see in your sittings, you can go very much deeper and everything. So it's very special once you figure out the clues he gave you and you add them all up. And so in this particular sutta, uh, we find out that he's been practicing for a very long time, over six years, and um, now he's teaching the monks, he's awake and he's teaching the monks, and he spends time in this particular sutta pointing out things that the monks should not be spending time on. So he's recalling to them things that he tried that were worthless and didn't help him to get to the point where he could wake up. And so he's, he's requesting, you have to visualize this as a, a, he has, he's running a meditation school and he's, it's sort of like a gypsy and he's going all over India, moving around in India, you know, and he's learning, uh, he's teaching different groups of people in different places. And um, as he goes along, um, he's teaching his monks and organizing the school. And there's uh, one account talking about how the Sangha all got organized too. We'll, we should do that one sometime, May. That's a really good one where it talks about, um, I have some account in one of the books about how he organized the school and brought it together. But this one, as I said, is special. So let's get to work on this and we'll start at the beginning. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living at Waisali in the great wood in the hall with the peaked roof. Now on that occasion, when it was morning, the blessed one had finished dressing and he had taken his bowl and outer robe, desiring to go into Waisali for alms. And then as Sachika, the Nagantha's son was walking and wandering for exercise. He came to the hall with the peaked roof in the great wood. The venerable Ananda saw him coming in the distance and said to the blessed one, venerable sir, here comes Sachika, the Nagantha's son, a debater and a clever speaker regarded by many as a saint. He wants to discredit the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. It would be good if the Blessed One would sit down for a while out of compassion. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready, and then Satchika, the Nagantha's son, went up to the Blessed One and engaged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, there are some recluses and Brahmins who abide pursuing development of body, but not development of mind. They are touched by bodily painful feeling. In the past, when one was touched by bodily painful feeling, one 
thighs uh, would when you, uh, one's thighs would become rigid, one's heart would burst, not hot blood would gush from one's mouth, one would go mad, go out of one's mind. And so then the mind was subservient to the body. The body wielded master over it. Why is that? Because the mind was developed. But there are some recluses and Brahmins who abide pursuing the development of mind, but not development of body. And they are touched by mental painful feeling. In the past, when one was touched by mental painful feeling, one thighs would become uh, rigid and the heart would burst, hot blood would gush from one's mouth and one would go mad, go out of one's mind. And so then the body was subservient to the mind and the mind wielded mastery over it. Why is that? Because the body was not developed. Master Godama, it has occurred to me, surely Master Godama's disciples abide pursuing development of mind, but not development of body. But uh, uh, Jivasana, uh, what have you learned about development of the body? Well, uh, there are, for example, Nanda, Vacha, Kisa, Sachikicha, Michele, Gosala, they go naked, rejecting conventions, licking their hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked, and they do not accept food, brought or food, specially made, or an invitation to any meal. They receive nothing from a pot, from a bowl, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food is advertised to be distributed, from where a dog is waiting, from where flies are buzzing. They accept no fish or meat. They drink no liquor, wine, or fermented brew. They keep to one house, to one morsel, they keep to two houses, to two morsels, they keep to seven houses, to seven morsels, they live on one saucer full a day, or two saucerfuls a day, or seven saucerfuls a day, uh, they take food once a day, once every two days, or once every seven days, and, and thus even up to uh, once every fortnight, and they dwell pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. There's great many things that the ascetics do in India. Um, and when you're in India, you're likely to be walking across the street and see somebody sitting naked in the middle of the road on a line uh, covered with paint and dust and everything and wondering what's going on. You never know what you're going to find when you go in the country. But do they subsist on so little Ajivasana? No, Master Gotama. Uh, sometimes they consume excellent hard food, excellent soft food, taste excellent delicacies, drink excellent drinks, and thereby they again regain their strength. They fortify themselves and then they become fat. Well, what they earlier abandoned Ajivasana uh, they later gather together again, says the Buddha. That is how uh, there is increase and decrease of this body. But what have you learned about the development of mind? When Sachika the Nagantha's son was asked by the Blessed One this question about development of mind, he was unable to answer. And then the Blessed One told him, what you have just spoken as of as the development of body and divasana is not the development of body according to the Dhamma in the Noble One's discipline. Since you do not know what development of body is, how could you know what development of mind is? Nevertheless, a divasana 
as to how one is undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind and developed in body and developed in mind, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, Sachka the Nagantha's son replied, and the blessed one said this. How, Ajivasana, is one underdeveloped in body and underdeveloped in mind? Here, Ajivasana, pleasant feeling arises in an untaught ordinary person. Touched by a pleasant feeling, he lusts after pleasure and continues to lust after pleasure. That pleasant feeling of his ceases and with the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by a painful feeling, he sorrows, grieves, and laments. He weeps, beating his breast, and becomes distraught. And when the pleasant feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because body is not developed. And when a painful feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because mind is not developed. Anyone in whom in this double manner, arisen pleasant feeling invades his mind and remains because the body is not developed and arisen painful feeling invades his mind and remains because mind is not developed is thus undeveloped in his body and undeveloped in his mind. And how a jivasana is one developed in body and developed in mind. Here, Ajivasana, pleasant feeling arises in a well-taught noble disciple. Touched by that pleasant feeling, he does not lust after the pleasure or continue to lust after the pleasure. The pleasant feeling of his ceases, and with the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by that painful feeling, he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast, and become distraught. When that pleasant feeling has arisen in him, it does not invade his mind and remain because body is developed. And when that painful feeling has arisen in him, it does not invade his mind and remain because mind is developed. Anyone in whom, in this manner, this double manner, arisen pleasant feeling does not invade his mind and remain because the body is developed, an arisen painful feeling does not invade his mind and remain because mind is developed, in thus is thus developed in body and developed in mind. Now, can you all tell me what it is that he knows about why this is? What have we been talking about with dependent origination? How have we explained the seven links that are in this life here now? And when you understand how the links are operating, then you understand completely what? You understand this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just the occurrence of whatever is going on, which has not been there, has arisen, does exist, and then passes away. Just like it says in 111, when you're experiencing what Sariputta was experiencing in the practice, it wasn't there, it arises, it is there, and it passes away. So this is the Anicca. So understanding the Anicca, why would one get upset? Why would one get stressed? There's no reason for the stress. There's no reason for the tension. If you understand the Anicca and how the Dukkha works and how Anatta is involved in this, so he says, I have confidence in Master Godama thus. Master Godama is developed in body and developed in mind. Surely, Ajibasana, your words are offensive and discourteous, but still I will answer you. Because he says this because he knows what the Naganta teaches and he knows how he's just making a, sort of an absurd remark. Since I shaved off my head, my hair and beard, this is the Buddha speaking, put on a yellow robe and went forth from the home life into the homelessness, it has not been possible for a risen pleasant feeling to invade my mind and remain there. 
or for a risen painful, uh, painful feeling to invade my mind and remain. Has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade his mind and remain? Has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so painful that it could invade his mind and remain? Why not, Ajivasana? Here, Ajivasana, before my enlightenment, now he starts to explain a lot of things. So keep cued into this now. Before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, so he wasn't awakened, he's telling them what's going on while he's searching. Household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living at home to lead the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard and put on a yellow robe and go forth from home life into the homelessness. Later, while he is still young, a black haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life. You know, we have to go to 26. So you flip back to 26 and you go to section 14. And it's on page 256. Later, while I was still young, a black haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful face as I shaved off my hair and beard. I put on the yellow robe and I went forth from home life into homelessness. And having gone forth, monks, in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace. I went to Alara Kalama and I said to him, friend Kalama, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. Alara Kalama replied, and the venerable one may stay here. Uh, this Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it, realizing for himself through direct knowledge, his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned that Dhamma, as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed, I know and I see, and there were others who did likewise. I considered it is not through mere faith alone that Alara Kalama declares by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and bide in the Dhamma. So we see something here. We see that early when he was with Alara Kalama, he's getting a good taste of something. He's getting a good taste of the direction of the importance of direct knowledge. You see, he's getting a taste of this here. And when he begins to teach, he sets up a school that demands from his monks a particular kind of approach of knowledge, attaining knowledge and vision, which is the same thing as direct knowledge. He's calling it, I want you to see, this is what I've told you in our training. I want you to see what I'm talking to you about. I don't want you to accept it. I want you to see it and practice it by following precisely the instructions we're giving you. And then when you see it, then if you wanna say you believe something, it's up to you, but not from me. That's one reason Bhante and I talked about this. We're not, we don't wanna be teachers. We don't wanna be gurus. We want to be guides. We want to guide you how you can get to a level where you can see for yourself what he saw. We're trying to show you how to copy or repeat his investigation approach that he decides on. Certainly Alara Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. And then I went to Alara Kalama and I asked him, Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare uh, that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. And this is where he tells him, this is how far he went. I considered not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. So now what is that? 
What is FEMQA? F-E-M-C-W. <laughs> what is FEMQA? That's the faculties. So we meet the faculties here, the five faculties. So suppose I endeavor to realize uh, the Dhamma that Alara Kalama declares he entered upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. And then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, I said, friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. That is the way. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and I abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Ah, it is a gain for us, friend, Kalama says. It is a gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that I declare, I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in by realizing myself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that I know, and I know the Dhamma that you know. As I am, so are you. As you are, so am I. Come, friend, let us now lead the community together. So he offers him a deal. He basically offers him a deal. He offers him an opportunity to lead the community of hundreds of, of uh, followers that he has. And uh, thus, Kala Alara Kalama, the teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself and awarded me the highest of honors. But it occurred to me this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. So he knew the track he wanted to follow and he knew it wasn't happening here, but it only leads to the reappearance in the base of nothingness, the seventh level as far as we can go. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left, but still in search, monks, of what is wholesome, Seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Udaka Ramaputta, and I said to him, friend, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. Udaka Ramaputta, he replied, the venerable one may stay here. And this Dhamma is such that a wise man soon enters upon and abides in it, himself realizing through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned the Dhamma as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went. I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and I see. And there were others who did likewise. I considered it was not through mere faith alone that Rama declared by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. I entered upon and abided in this Dhamma. Certainly Rama abided knowing and seeing this Dhamma. And then I went to Udaka Ramaputta and asked him, I said, friend, in, in what way did Rama declare that by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma? In reply, Udaka Ramaputta declared the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I considered not only Rama had faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and with wisdom, but I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. He's still very balanced in the same way. But suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and aided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. Maybe I could get as far as him is what he's saying. And I soon quickly entered upon and abided in the Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge 
And then I went to Udaka Ramaputta and asked him, friend, was it in this way that Rama declared that he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma by realizing for himself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in the Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Ah, it is a gain for us. Friend, it is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. And so the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. And so you know the Dhamma that Rama knew and Rama knew the Dhamma that you know. As Rama was, so are you. As you are, so was Rama. Come friend, come and lead this community. But still, thus Yudaka Ramaputta, my companion in the holy life, placed me in a position of a teacher and accorded me the highest of honors. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to the Nibbana but only to reappearance in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. Let's see, Let go to 17, 17. Still in search, monks, of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I wandered by stages through the Magadan country until eventually I arrived at Uruvela in the Sena, uh, Sananigami, Sananigami. And there I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove with a clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks nearby to a village of alms resort. I, I considered this is an agreeable piece of ground. This is a delightful grove with a clear and uh, flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and uh, nearby a village for alms resort. So this will serve me very well for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. So I sat down thinking, mm -hmm. uh, this, this will serve for my striving. I turned back to 335 and I sat down and decided this was the place I would strive. Now, these three similes occurred to me spontaneously I never heard before. Suppose there were a wet and sappy piece of wood lying in water. And a man came with an upper fire stick thinking, I shall light a fire. I shall produce heat. What do you think, Ajiva Saina? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by taking an upper fire stick and rubbing it against a wet and sappy piece of wood that's lying in the water? No, Master Gautama. Why not? Well, because it, it is a sappy piece of wood and it is lying in the water and eventually the man would only reap only weary, weariness and disappointment. And so too, Ajiva Sena. As to those recluses and Brahmins, those who still do not live bodily uh, withdrawn, from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst, and fever for sensual pleasures has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Uh, even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, uh, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. This was the first simile that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. 
Again, Ajiba Sena, a second simile occurred to me spontaneously. Never heard before. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood lying on the ground, on land far from the water, and a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking I shall light a fire. I shall produce heat. What do you think? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing it against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying on the dry land far from the water? No, Master Godama. Why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood. And even though it is lying on the ground, on dry land, far from water, eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. This is true. And so too, Ajivasana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures, but whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, and thirst and fever for sensual pleasures has not been fully abandoned and let go of internally. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision. And supreme enlightenment, and even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to the exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. This was the second simile, and that occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. Again, Ajiva Sena, a third simile occurred to me and spontaneously never heard before. Suppose there were dry sapless piece of wood lying on the dry ground far from the water, and a man came with an upper fire stick and thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think, Ajiva Sena? Could the man light a fire and produce heat by rubbing it against the dry sapless piece of wood lying on dry land, far from the water? Yes, Master Godamu. And why so? Because it is the dry and sapless piece of wood and it is lying on the dry land far from the water. So too, Ajiba Sena, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, and thirst and fever for sensual pleasures has been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are capable to know, to, uh, capable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. They are able to see and watch even if they are in having pain coming up in their meditation. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are capable of knowledge and vision of supreme enlightenment. This was the third simile that occurred to him. So he has this simile coming up that whether you were feeling these painful racking piercing feelings or not feeling the painful racking piercing feelings, it would be possible for these people to understand that if they stuck with it, they would be able to see clearly this, uh, see clearly knowledge and vision, have knowledge and vision occur. These are the three similes that occurred to me spontaneously. They were never heard before. And I thought, suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I, if I, I beat down and constrain and crush mind with mind, so with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained and crushed mind with mind. While I did so, the sweat ran from my armpits. This was just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head and shoulders and beat him down and constrain him and crush him. So too, with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, mouth, I beat down and constrained and crushed mine with mine. The sweat ran from my armpits, but although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body became overwrought and uncalm. 
because I was exhausted by this painful striving. He's discovering something that he's trying so hard, but such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. It didn't come and stay. It arose and then it passed away. But this action was of no use to him. You'll hear more in just a minute. He decides, suppose I practice the breath, breathingless meditation. And so I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth and nose. And while I did so, there was a loud sound of winds coming out from my ear holes. Now, how did he do that? Okay, what they do is if you open your mouth and raise your tongue up, right here, there's a little piece of skin between the root of the tongue and keeps it from falling back in your throat. And what they used to do is clip that. They cut it and then swallowed their tongue. Just as there is a loud sound with the smith's bellows are blowing, when the smith's bellows are blowing, so too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my nose and ears, there was a loud sound of wind that was coming out of my ear holes. But although this tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was um, aroused in me and um, established, my, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was so exhausted from the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So it didn't come into his mind and remain there. It came in, it passed through, and it went away. So I thought, suppose I practice further this breathingless meditation. Now, why is he doing this? Why is, why is he doing this painful stuff that he's doing? Is because the principle at, at the time he was attempting to find the way to Nirvana, the whole principle was if we cause enough pain and torture the body enough, then what will happen is the mind will open. But it didn't work. It didn't work. So here he says, I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. And while I did so, violent winds cut through my head. And just as if a strong man were to crush my head with the tip of a sharp sword, so too, I, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, violent winds cut through my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body became overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling that arose in me it did not invade my mind and remain either. It did not yet come and stay there and go. And this is also, he's discovering pain, about pain here. Uh, they study at the Mayo uh, Pain Clinic uh, in um, Minnesota area of the United States. You know, pain has a cycle, any kind of pain that's happening, whether it's a broken leg, uh, whether it's grief if someone dies, all these things, these kinds of pain, they have a cycle, they have a pattern. And if you figure out what the pattern is, you can simply allow the pattern to come and to go and to come and to go and not be disturbed so much by it. If you don't understand what's happening, you feel like it's happening to you, but actually this is just floating through and in, in a cycle. And if you don't get tense and afraid of it and everything because you don't understand it, you watch the cycle, identify it when it begins and say, oh, pain is here. And you let it go through and go by. It makes it easier for you to handle the pains that happen in the body. Or if something is an accident and you're pinned down, it makes you so that you can relax and just allow this, whatever is in the truth of the moment, it can happen and just happen as it is normally would happen. So he thought, I, I will practice further the breathlessness, breathingness um, um, 
meditation. So I stopped the in breaths and the out breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. And while I did so, there were violent pains in my head. This is what happens when you short out your oxygen. Just as a strong man were tightening a tough leather strap around my head, like a headband, went, while I stopped the in breaths and out breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, there were violent pains in my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and I'm calm again because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful striving that arose in me, it did not go in my mind and, and stay. It went, it didn't go in and remain. It arose, it existed, it passed away again. Now, one thing I didn't mention to you was like when I first started reading. You know, we start, first started to explain at 20, this is a very interesting phenomenon, and the, the scholars haven't been able to explain this to me, but okay, in 20, Sutta number 20, um, there is this teaching about this is one of the ways you can handle your hindrances by, um, suppose I clench at my with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of the mouth. So back in 20, where this is being talked about in, in Sutta number 20, I can tell you what section it is, wait a second, I marked it here. Um, in Sutta number 20, when you go back there, it's being suggested and we're saying, we're suggesting that this is not a legitimate way of removing uh, distracting thoughts because when you start talking, it's in section seven, okay? When you, when you use this as a method to get rid of your hindrances, you're denying everything else in this book, 152 suttas. There's like 11 suttas dedicated just to talking about hindrances. You are denying how the hindrances actually work if you fight with them like this. And so here in 20, some people, it's not just us, or some other people are suspect of this sutta being put into the Majima Nikaya at a later date and not at a time in the beginning when they first put the machine kind together. It's just a suspect. Why is it suspect? Because it's instructing you to do something that absolutely does not work. And um, when we're talking about removing hindrances, we're not talking about removing hindrances in a retreat for you to practice. We're talking about removing hindrances so they don't re reoccur in your life. We're talking about caring one thing, teaching you a practice that's going to work in conjunction with your life. This is one of the most important things about Twim. But what it says in 20, he's now denying in 36. That's what I'm trying to point out to you. And where does it appear in 36 is very odd, isn't it? Because it appears that that instruction is being said again uh, in section 20 of Sutta 36. And that is another reason it makes it very suspect of how, why is this happening like this, that it would reflect back to, to Sutta number 20 is the other place you find it. And one place is saying, use this as a method of getting rid of your hindrances. The other place it's, it's saying, don't, you don't do this because it's not, it's not something that is causing a new condition for you. It just arises, it's there, it's passing away. Okay, so we're up to 23. I think we're, is that right? We're up at 23? Mm, strap around my head, okay. I think we are in 24. That's right, in 24. So now he's going to, in section 24, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and um, I stopped uh, the uh, out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. And while I did so, violent winds carved up my belly. Just as a skillful butcher and his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife, so too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, violent winds carved up my belly. But although tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was uh, established. My body was overwrought and uncalm because I became exhausted by the painful striving. And this painful uh, feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain. 
it was there, it was there, and it was gone. Okay. Now the holding the breath again at 25. Suppose I practice further breathingless meditation. And so I stopped the in breaths and out breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears. While I did so, there was violent burning in my body. And just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by his arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals, two, uh, in the same way, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose, and ears, there was a violent burning in my body. But although the tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving again, you see, okay? And um, this painful feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain, okay? In 26, now when the deities saw me, some of them said, the recluse Godama is dead. And other deities said, the recluse Godama is not dead. He is dying. And other deities came down and said, the recluse Godama is not dead or dying. He is an arahat, for such is the way of these arahats. Abide. That's how they abide. And I thought, suppose I practice entirely cutting off my food instead. <laughs> so he's still going to attempt to force whatever it is he's hunting for to, to happen. He's still going to try to force it personally. This is the whole idea This he's trying to get across to these monks not to spend time doing this because of what's happening to him. And then the deities came to me and they said, <clears throat> good sir, do not practice entirely cutting off food because if you do this, we shall infuse heavenly food into the pores of your skin and you will live on that. They were refusing to let him die. And if I claim to be completely fasting, while these deities infuse heavenly food into the pores of my skin and I live on that, then I shall be lying. And so I dismissed those deities saying, there, there is no need, there is no need, go away, he basically said. <laughs> and then he thought, suppose I take very little food, a handful each time, whether it's bean soup or lentil soup or veg soup or pea soup. So I took very little food, just a handful each time. And whether it was bean soup, lentil soup, veg soup, or pea soup, while I did this, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. And this is where we see how bad it got for him. And it's described now, how skinny did he get denying himself food? Because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jointed segments of vine stems or bamboo stems. You got to go and get those things to see what this is about. Because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof, where the skin is so hard and cracked and dried out, it's peeling off. And because of eating so little, the projections on my spine, he's talking about his discs, stood forth like corded beads on his back. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. Because of eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank far down in their sockets, looking like the gleam of water that was sunk far down in a deep well. <clears throat> because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a green bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and the sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. And thus, if I touched my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. And if I touched my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Only people I know that can experience this is the mother who gives birth right after the baby comes out. And the doctor showed me how I could put my hand on my stomach 
just about 10 minutes or well I was out of the delivery room for 10 minutes and he came by and said gave me a blanket and said put your hand on your belly stop shivering and um, you can feel your backbone and I put my hand on my belly and I could feel my backbone because none of the organs had fallen back into place yet but this is an actual condition because of eating so little I defecated I could, if I defecated or urinated, I fell over on my face then and there. And because of eating so little, if I tried to ease my body by rubbing my limbs with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots and fell from my body as I rubbed it. And then when people saw me, they said, oh, the recluse Godema, he is black. Other people said the recluse Godema is not black, he is brown. And other people said the recluse Godema is neither brown nor black or brown or brown. He is golden skinned. And so much had the clear, bright color of my skin deteriorated through eating so little, no one could recognize who this was. And I thought, whatever recluses or Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, there is none beyond this. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will experience any painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost, there is none beyond this. Whatever recluses and Brahmins at present experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion. This is the utmost. There is none beyond this. <clears throat> but this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any super states, superhuman states, or any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. And then he says to himself, could there be another path to enlightenment? Here we come. In 31, anybody who left before they got to 31 cheated themselves here. <laughs> you have to get to 31 to find out what's really going on here. I considered, he said, I recall when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied while I was sitting in the cool shade of the rose apple tree quite secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. Could that be the path to enlightenment, he wonders. And then following on that memory came the realization that indeed is the path to enlightenment. Now, why am I so excited about this verse? What's going on with Sister Gaiman? Because I was in the forest and the direction we were given after we heard this sutta was go out and find a big tree, sit down, lean against the tree by yourself and see what happens, you see. And this is without fighting anything, understanding that it ever arises, always passes away. And simply surrendering completely to just sitting there with your back leaning against a tree. You have to go for yourself. Find a pine tree. I always suggest that because there's not so many bugs. Put a blanket down, sit down alone, and just see what he discovered. He discovered that if you just sit quietly and watch that everything will unfold, but you didn't have to torture yourself in any way like this. None of the things he did brought him to any, um, none of them brought him to any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the nodal ones. This is what we're trying to show you. And this is this clue here. He changed track in his method of approach for his practice at this point. And then following on that memory came the realization, this indeed is the path to enlightenment. He realizes, wow, letting go and just being quiet and calm and watching sincerely and keeping your observation going and not surrendering to any hindrances at all. Now, in this, it did mention that these things are inside, they're suppressed. But when we 
look at what suppressed meant closely, <clears throat> we discovered these things were not suppressed, they were permanently abandoned. And that's how they got suppressed was through permanent abandonment. So what all the things that were bothering him uh, or hindrances, distractions, disturbances, obstacles, obstructions, or anything happening in his meditation, he realized, he came to the realization, if you abandon them, you're not feeding them nutriment anymore. Even just in the Majima Nikai, there's nine or 11, something like that, of all these suttas directing you to the primary directive the Buddha gives his meditators who he's training, the primary direction he gives them is abandonment. As soon as I realized the state of imperfection due to something going on in my mind or some hindrance I was thinking about, I abandoned it. As soon as I realized paying attention to it was an imperfection, I abandoned it. So here he's completely changing tracks. And he's finding out that he doesn't have to do all these things. And the re importance of the sutta is immense because it shows monks who are have enough information about the dependent origination if they've been trained enough on that and they understand anatta, nothing is personal. Nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you. This is an amazing discovery. You're actually in control by not taking any type of forceful control. You become ultimately in control of your life. This is what this is about. It is a freedom. It is the way to actually actuate what some people in the world today are actually talking about the problem with mankind and how to shift to another level but they're not showing you a method to do it. And I'm showing you the method to do it, to experience it precisely, is by letting go, relaxing and smiling. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Today, my students and I were discussing that the six steps, actually there are four, four steps. Six R's, there's four things to do. When you start it, you obviously have recognized something, right? So the first step is to recognize when something is pulling you away. Well, the moment you think to use the steps, you have recognized, okay? And if you just think, let go, relax, smile, come back, that's it. Repeat is not a step. Repeat is a reminder, isn't it? Repeat is, this is what we're going to do today, gang. So always repeat, 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 repeat. Well, we can tell you that before you do the actual what it is. And here we come to the four pieces of right effort. We're back to the four succinct steps to recognize the distraction or uh, the what's pulling you away, to let go of that, and, and then to relax and to smile, and the relax and smile is the retraining of the brain, isn't it? Those two are the retraining. The purification was to, was to let go and relax and then smile and come back. I'm sorry, the smile and come back is to keep going, keep putting the smile into everything you're doing and keep that frame. When you're, when you're relaxing and smiling, watch how it feels. And anything in life that is in front of you can can you produce a whole day of keeping that kind of stuff in your mind? Sure. Go out and look at the kids smiling at each other and playing and having a good time and decide I'm going to smile and have a good time today. I mean, I walk downtown amongst all these people that are here and I just smile and smile and smile and people start smiling back. You see, I can produce a whole bunch of 50 or 60 people who are just kind of walking around and some of them are tired and everything. And then I can turn it all around by smiling. And if they look at me and they see me smiling, they turn and they start smiling. How's it happening? It's an energy. It's a vibration. It is a frequency that is flowing off of you. You want to change the world? 
you know how you think it should be. You know how you think there should be, uh, you know, forgiveness and compassion and loving kindness and all that in the world. You know that? Start putting it in the world. What's wrong? Do we need the UN to make that happen? <laughs> we don't need anybody to make that happen. You go out and decide the whole day to forgive whatever is going on all day long. And the thoughts that come in, no matter if there are thoughts about it, just forgive yesterday. It's gone. It's done. And don't worry about tomorrow. It's not here yet. You see? And try to see what happens when you, when you stay there, how sharp your mind is. So if you need to think about a solution for something that's going to happen tomorrow, well, take the present time, sit down, figure it out, and use it. I'm challenging you, you know? What are we waiting for? Why are we all out here talking about this? And we keep chanting and having services and celebrations and all this stuff constantly. But when are we going to decide to do what we know is the right thing? You take 1,000 people listening to what I'm saying right now and go out tomorrow and just do it. What's keeping you from actually doing it? What are you waiting for? For somebody to come in the door and I oh, this is the people who have decided we figured out what's wrong with the world. Uh, why are you at my door? Because we'd like to give you permission now to start to forgive everything and smile and go out and have a good time. <laughs> Here's your pass. I'm giving you your pass. Here it is. I'm going to give you the little card. Here it is. Okay. You can. Here's your little card. See, you can have the card. It says, now change the world. I'm telling you right now, before I go, I want to see you change this world. That's all. Simple. So here we go. He says, I considered, I recall when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied. And what he's talking about is the harvest festival. And all the people went out into the field, the adults, and they put this child, when he was young, under this tree to just sit there. He didn't have to be out there with the others. We think he was pretty young, and probably the uh, nanny sat him under the tree. And he sat him under there. And then, he, you know, he was in the cool shade of the rose apple tree. He was secluded from these people, away from all the noise and stuff that was going on in the festival. He was secluded. And he, he was um, certainly not in a place of any unwholesome states. And he fell. He was just sitting still and calm and quiet. And he just fell into the first jhana. He didn't get the first jhana, grab the first jhana, make the first jhana happen. He simply fell into the first jhana. And then he went further, you see? I thought, I, why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? When you are in these jhanas, you begin to feel, they say blissful states. It's just a good feeling inside. It's very nice, very beautiful, and free from what is going on in the madness of the world. And when you are feeling these things, I'm not afraid, he said, of pleasure like this because it has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states, evil unwholesome states, where it would hurt yourself or someone else or cause something to happen that's bad in the world. So inside, in, in, in your meditation, why should you deny yourself feeling joy when joy is going to come up, be there and go away. And if you understand that rule of Anicca, why should you deny yourself feeling joy? There's no reason in the world why you should be afraid of it. If you understand the key way that suffering occurs. So how does it work? A feeling comes up, which is pleasant after contact of some kind, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking, a feeling arises. And it's either pleasant or painful or neutral. If this is a pleasant feeling, it's fine. And you can, you know, but when craving says, I like it, then you be careful not to grab onto it and start thinking about what it's like with everything else that's ever happened in the world and want to hold onto it. Why? 
Because if you understand the way this operates is from feeling to I like it, to I want it, to attachment in clinging, it's the holding on. For instance, there's nothing wrong with your five aggregates or my five aggregates. And the fact that people are writing books today saying the suffering aggregates, we have a problem. We have to live with the suffering aggregates. My aggregates are not suffering. Your aggregates are not suffering. There's no suffering aggregates unless I hold on and cling. Now, see, when the phrase says the aggregates affected by clinging, there's the key. It doesn't say the aggregates are suffering. It said the aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. That's what it said. But people are changing this, you see? They're, playing, they're changing it and they're playing with it because they're not spending enough time meditating to actually experience how these steps are working. These steps are absolutely perfect the way he explained it. They're not wrong, but if you start saying your aggregates are bad, my aggregates are bad, what's wrong with your aggregates? What are the five aggregates? My body, the fact I can have feeling, perception, perceiving what's happening, thoughts that arise, and consciousness. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with this at all. But the five aggregates, when affected by clinging, or the five aggregates affected by clinging, that's a problem. Because the clinging makes the painful suffering happen. It isn't going to happen unless I fall into denial of anicca. That's why Anicca is your friend. Anicca is my friend. Oh, Sister Kama, Anicca is terrible. Oh, Anicca. No, it can also be your friend. If you remember, you're never stuck with anything. Nobody is stuck anymore. Nobody is stuck. You can change if you understand how things work. That's why this teaching was so incredibly important to what they're talking about now in relationship to um, the world with there's a biologist that's in Australia talking about the chaos in the world and how it happened and all of that. But the thing that's missing in so far, I mean, I'm listening to his videos, but I, so far, I cannot find the methodology where you would teach people how to fix this very quickly and start to make it work, work, work. And I'm telling you right now, the way to do that is TWIM, is to practice these four steps of, you know, let go, relax, smile, and come back, and not hold on to things and just keep moving. After all, I gave you a little car. I told you, here's your little car. <laughs> I told you, here's your little car going through life. Why are you not just staying in this little car? Why do you have to carry with you all these little things inside, all these little things inside that are things that happened in the past? Why do you have to carry them with you? Close your trunk. <laughs> Close the trunk. You ever see a person driving down the highway with their trunk open and I used to Make it, I would be late to an appointment if I had followed that person for 20 miles to tell them that their trunk is open and they need to shut their trunk on the highway before something terrible happens, you know? Don't leave your trunk open when you're driving your car because you're just putting things that happened in the past in there and then you're carrying them with you. Close the trunk, dump it out and close the trunk and you will drive through life a lot better. So he says, I'm not afraid of pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and, and, and unwholesome states that, that I'm holding on to, that I'm clinging to. I thought I'm not afraid of, the, of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with the unwholesome states and, and unwholesome things. I considered it's not easy to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. So this is the point where he decides all of this stuff I've just done, all the stuff we just described, and there's another suit about this. I'll do it for you sometime. I think it's number 12. 
that gives you all a picture of all of the things that he tried to do to torture himself before he got to this point. And he says, it's not easy to attain uh, that pleasure with a body so emaciated. And suppose I eat some solid food, some boiled rice and porridge, and this is where the milk and the rice was given to him. I ate some solid food and some boiled rice and porridge. And now at that time, the five bhikkhus who were with him, the five ascetics, okay, were waiting upon me thinking if our recluse Gotama achieves some higher state, he will inform us. But when I ate that boiled rice and porridge, he says, the five bhikkhus, they were disgusted and they left me thinking the recluse Gotama now lives luxuriously. I like this, you know, they're thinking he's living luxuriously. Here he is just like a skeleton and he's trying to eat and survive. And they're saying, you're living luxuriously. He has given up striving. He has reverted into luxury and they left him. They went away. Now, when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, there you go. Who sat under the tree? Was it this person that was a skeleton? or who just had a little bit to eat and then went back to sit? No, he paused a period of time. He regained his health. He regained his strength. He ate properly, slept properly, and probably took a bath, okay? And then he quite secluded from central pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states he entered upon in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking, examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. But such pleasant feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. He began to watch the functionality of Anicca in process as part of the mechanism. He started to see the, how Anicca was working. And with the stilling of the uh, thinking and examining thought I entered upon in the second jhana, he gets in and the fading away as well of a joy he enters upon and goes into the third one. And with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he, uh, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. But such pleasant feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. And when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, no disturbance, full equanimity, I directed it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. So he's using now the approach to Nibbana of going through the knowledges. Okay, and there are three way, three knowledges here. I recollected my manifold past lives as one, two, three births. If we go back to sutta number four, we turn back to sutta number four in section 27. And um, in section 27, mm -hmm. five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, 100 births, 1,000 births, 100,000 births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansions. And there I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such was my life term and passing away from there. And I, I appeared elsewhere. And there too, I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance and such was my nutriment, my experience, pleasure and pain and life term and passing away. And I reappeared here. And thus there were aspects and particulars that I recollected throughout my, my um, past lives. So this is his karma. Uh, confirmation, his, his absolute understanding of karma from allowing himself to roll back time and keep rolling it back and just not stop. And he's balanced enough to go through life after life after life after life and going back um, through whole periods of time, large, large periods of time. And thus, with the aspects and particulars I recollect in my past lives. And this was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. 
remember the watches of the night, so 7 to 11, um, and then 11 to 3, wait, sorry, 11 to 3, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, and then 3 to 7 is the third watch, okay? So ignorance in the first watch of the night, ignorance was banished, true knowledge arose, darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute, but such pleasant feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain. It became a source of knowledge, but it didn't get stuck and hold, I didn't hold on to it as he's saying. When my concentrated mind was thus purified and bright, unblemished and rid of imperfect malleable means it can move be bendable and watch everything that's happening inside wieldy it's wieldy i can move it this i can look here and look here and look here it's it's flexible what you're watching steady and attained to imperturbability i directed to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings and this is another account i'm not going to go back there but i will you can go back it's four in section 29 and you go to 29 and it's basically saying my con uh, okay i directed it to the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings and this is more about karma and this is the deeper part with the divine eye which is purified and pass surpasses the human i saw beings passing away and reappearing it's the deeper version of this inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass away um, according to their actions, how they move on. Um, and these worthy beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, the revilers of the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a sad, bad des destination, in perdition, and even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted and body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in a heavenly world. And thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, the inferior, superior, fair and ugly, fortunate, unfortunate. And I understood how beings pass on according to their actions. So it's actually a lesson in how you can visit hell see somebody, sit down with them, and um, mentally have a discussion with them, not actually speaking to them, talking, having a communication, a mental communication with them to find out why they're there and what happened. And you're wondering why they're there. So they can tell you, and this is actually a practice. Don't believe me, you know, <laughs> but it is a practice that can be taught and, and you need to be around a teacher if you do it, because sometimes you see really, really, really freaky things, but it can be done. It's not an impossible thing to do. Um, this was the second true knowledge attained by me. Um, ignorance was banished, true knowledge arose, darkness was banished, light arose, as, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. Um, but uh, such a pleasant feeling that arose in me, it did not invade my mind and remain. And when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright and unblemished, and it was rid of all per imperfection, it was malleable, wieldy and steady again, attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. And he looks very closely at the destruction of the taints and he realizes I knew as it actually is, there is suffering. He sees the very, very clearly the four uh, noble truths, there is suffering, this is the this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And these are the taints. Okay, um, the this is the origin of the taints, and, and this is the cessation of the taints, and this is the way leading to the cessation of taints. He's seeing the eightfold path really clearly. So when I knew 
And I saw thus my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire and from the taint of being. And we say the taint of habitual tent reactions. There's no more re reactions that are going to happen for you. And from the taint of ignorance. And when it, it was um, liberated, there came the knowledge. It is liberated. And I directly knew birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being beyond this being. And this was the third true knowledge attained by me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute. But such pleasing feeling that arose in me it did not invade my mind and just remain. Ajivasana, I recall teachings the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of many hundreds. And even then, each person thinks of me, the recluse Gotama is teaching a Dhamma, especially for me, especially for me. But it should not be so regarded that Tathagata teaches the Dhamma to others only to give them knowledge. When the talk is finished, then I study my mind internally, I quiet it, bring it to singleness, concentrated on the same sign of concentration I used before, this observation, this collectedness of mind where he was observing before, in which I constantly abide and can live all the time in until the day he dies, teaching for 45 years. He's living in that. And when the talk was finished, this is a matter about which Master Gotama can be trusted. And as an accomplished and fully enlightened one should be. But does Master Gotama recall sleeping during the day? I recall, Ajiva Sena, in the last month of the hot season on returning to, from my alms round after a meal, I lay out my robe folded it in four and lying down on my right side, I fall asleep mindful and fully aware. Some recluses and Brahmins call that abiding in delusion, Master Gotama. It is not in such a way that one is deluded or undeluded, Ajiva Sena. As to how one is deluded or undeluded, listen closely to me to what I shall say. Yes, sir, Sacha of the Nagantha's son replied, and the blessed one said this, him I call deluded Ajivasena, who has not abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal to their being, and give trouble, ripen in suffering, and, and lead a few, to future births, aging, and death. For it is with a non-abandoning of the taints that one is deluded. And him I call undiluted, who has abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal of being, and stop reacting, okay, and stop being reborn. If there's no energy pushing you along, you're not going to be reborn to do all this again and again and again. Give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. So for it is with the abandoning of the taints that one is undiluted. The Tathagata Ajivasena has abandoned the taints that defile and bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, and done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm tree whose crown is cut off is incapable of further growth, so too the Tathagata has abandoned his taints that defile and done away with them completely so that they are no longer subject to future arising. And when this was said, Sachika, the Nagata son, said, It is wonderful, Master Gotama. It is marvelous how, when Master Gotama is spoken to offensively again and again, assailed by discourteous courses of speech, the color of his skin just brightens and the color of his face clears, as is to be expected of one who is accomplished and fully enlightened. 
I recall Master Gotama exchanging Purana Kasapa in debate, and then he prevaricated, led the talk aside, and showed such anger, hate, and bitterness. But when Master Gotama is spoken to offensively again and again, assaulted by discourteous courses of speech. The color of his skin brightens and the color of his face clears as is to be expected of one who is accomplished and fully enlightened. I recall Master Gotama again engaging Mikhail Gosala, Ajita Kesakambalan, and Pakuda Kachayana and Sanyana and all these people in debate. And then he prevaricated. He led the talk aside and showed anger and hate and bitterness. But when Master Gotama is spoken to offensively again and again, assailed by this discourteous course of speech, the color of his skin brightens and the color of his face clears. And as is to be expected of one who is accomplished and fully enlightened, now Master Gotama, ah, we depart. We are busy and we have much to do. And Satchika, the Nagansa's son, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, he got up from his seat and he departed. Now, this sutta, you know, is showing you, you know, holding your breath, it doesn't work. And uh, to any degree, suppression of your feeling, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't, doesn't work. Um, fasting to any degree of sovereignty, it doesn't work. So should we be having monks come in now today? Should they be doing these kinds of practices again? And the answer is no, no. The teaching is here. Him telling you don't waste time with this is here, showing you the direct way to go in. Why aren't we doing this? You got me. I can't figure it out. I, I get fascinated by seeing somebody who's just almost skin and bones. And why? Why? It's again, you know, if there was a, I know the whole teaching in Christianity got kind of mixed up in heresy and all this thing, you know, all the burning people at the stake and all that stuff, have, the heretics and all that stuff. It got really twisted around there in history somehow, somehow, really, really bad. But these things weren't taught. They weren't taught like that. Was love, compassion, forgiveness do unto others as you would have them do unto you? This is right here in Buddhism too, you know? Whatever you put out, you get back. Okay, that's karma. What goes around, comes around, that's karma. These things were taught, you know, pretty balanced. And we think that um, uh, many people think that when Jesus was teaching, when he went after his bar mitzvah at 12 years old, when he was wandering around before he came back and started teaching, he went on a manhood journey and he went to the Far East. Many, many people believe this before he came back and started teaching. He wasn't teaching except in, as 30 to 33 years old. It's only three years of teaching, you see? So the things that he could have learned if he went to the East, even as far as Kashmir, if he did go there, is this something that he would have been exposed to some of these teachings. I, I get very excited about this when I see that. That could have happened to him, you know? So when you look here and you see what he's telling his monks, not, don't torture yourselves. You don't have to deny yourself breathing. You don't have to deny yourself food. You don't have to do anything like this because I'm showing you it didn't work. But permanent changes came in his teaching, especially through the Brahma Viharas, which we're using with you. And those changes that are coming from the Brahma Viharas are sincere changes of practicing loving kindness and not having any thoughts of ill will come up and then embracing the compassion and having no thoughts of cruelty come up and the, uh, allowing yourself to have joy. Why not? Enjoy comes up and it's there and anything you have happening in your life, when you're enjoying it and you're keeping your precepts and you're doing good things, enjoy it. 
Don't walk around with a sad sack on your face with your frown and think that you can't smile if you're a Buddhist. If you believe that, you need to come and hang out with me for a while. <laughs> because there's no point in it. It's not going to help you, your life, your health, or anything if you do that. And that's, you have this wonderful opportunity. This teaching is here. It's here now. You're born in this dispensation. It's still here. Go back to his words and really start to look closely at the clues he's giving you of what to do and what not to spend time with. So that's the spiel on this. And this is what really changed at section 30 is where uh, we find out he thought this is another approach. I'm going to do it. He sits under the tree. He becomes enlightened. He starts teaching. And then these, these suttas are coming from 45 years of teaching. And, um, and what um, the key pieces of his teaching and how he put it out to his own mind. So anybody have comments? I know this was probably pretty long. I don't know. I didn't even look at the time. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We're not too bad. But okay. So anybody have any questions, you can write me a note. Or May, you've got a question? Anybody? Uh, I don't really have a question today. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I thought I saw your little light go off. I'm sorry. I'm going like this. <laughs> okay, so think about this. And as I said earlier, one of the things we should not restrict ourselves from is when we find out there are things that can change our lives. And these things can make it better for ourselves and for other people. Take hold of them and do it. Don't hold back. And forgiveness is probably the biggest thing. You cannot control other people. You cannot change other people. You cannot um, fix other people. And it's sort of a desperation that is, end, it's sort of a dead end thing and causes only more frustration and stress and tension in the person's life. But you can change your direction yourself and you can forgive the person your work is the forgiveness of working through that um, forgiveness program and then starting working with loving kindness. And you have to use this stuff all the time. It doesn't change people unless you're using it all the time. And you have to dedicate yourself to no matter what happens in your life, looking at the structure of the Four Noble Truths and saying, okay, what's the challenge right now? That's the suffering, obviously. And what do I think the cause of this challenge is? And what do I think the solution is? And then going after it by looking at your Brahma Viharas, examining them closely and letting go of ill will and cruelty and discontent and aversion to everything and, all this, and talking about how you don't like things and what's happening to you all the time is to a large extent how you accept what's happening and, how, and what you're going to do about it. How you're going to accept, are you going to, how, what are you going to do with it? You believe everything's happening to you, or do you believe that you have chosen to live by, from yourself, everything is happening from you, from your perception and perspective of how you decide to look at things. You're in charge. It's your ship. Let's watch what happens when you sail it. Okay. Let's say a prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and death and space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Bhante. See you guys all Thank next you. week. Should be okay for next week. Should be there with you. Keep the peace, make other people happy and you'll get happy, okay? Go for it. Bye-bye.